Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Aquilani History Podcast. I hope your week has been going well so far. Um, If you've just watched the recently concluded AFCON, I'd like to say congratulations to Cote d'Ivoire for hosting and winning the AFCON tournament and commiserations to the Super Eagles and Nigerians. It was a tough one, wasn't it? Um, I hope you're winning in life. Uh, Congratulations to you if you're celebrating an achievement, you know, whatever it is, a certification, perhaps for yourself or your partner or some major life event in yourself or family member, um, celebrating all the little wins. And I wish you many more wins. So this is the week of love as well. So happy Valentine's to you, my gorgeous listener. May your heart be filled with joy and love and may your face always have that special glow. We're in the second episode of a new series focusing on the history of the Wari Kingdom through the complex web of religion, trade, politics and war. Um, Before we press on, I just want to make some quick corrections from last week's um, episode, episode one. Um, So the Spanish and Portuguese kingdoms were in personal union 1581, not 1851. And the period of interregnum on the Wari throne was between 1848 and 1936, so 88 years. Last week, we learned of the origins of the Wari kingdom, its kings or olus, and their Catholic traditions, as well as the rise of slave trade. In episode two today, we will uncover the rise and fall in slave trade, why there was a decline in slave trade and the efforts the British Empire put into quelling the issue once and for all, including the commissioning of a squadron of ships to patrol the seas and hunt down the slave ships. In fact, the title of this episode is named after one of these ships that was a member of the West African squadron that patrolled the coast of West Africa, named the Fair Rosamond. And incidentally, the Fair Rosamond was once a slave ship herself that was caught and then converted into a naval ship. Let's find out how all of these played out and dive into today's episode. Episode 2 of the History of Worry, The Fair Rosamund. The trade in palm oil and the slave trade are so closely linked that it is impossible to talk about one without talking about the other. One is smeared onto the other, not unlike how palm oil smears so easily onto all the fingers when it comes into contact with just one. The trade in palm oil in this region had begun from 1780s, right in the thick of slave trade, and it developed partially due to slave trade and alongside it. Now, palm oil is derived from the fleshy fruits of the palm, scientifically named Elias Guinensis. 10 points to you if you remember that from Agric Science. Now, the oil was consumed locally for cooking and also used for cosmetics and the sap of the tree was tapped to make palm wine and hey, why not? Life was hard enough and blurry vision with a little dizziness might be indicated from time to time. However, drink responsibly. I digress, we're here for the oil and not the wine. Anyways, palm oil made and still makes everything taste better. I mean, you all used to this ask my little nephew who refused to touch the pasta his mom made once it was sufficiently coated with vegetables cooked in premium quality palm oil. I can still hear his two-year-old lips smacking. But the value and demand for palm oil 200 years ago laid not in its culinary uses but in its demand by Europe. At the turn of the 1800s, far away in Europe with the Industrial Revolution picking up, there was an increased demand for a steady and predictable source of oils for industrial production of lubricants, for manufacturing of soaps and creams, for manufacturing of candles, and to be used as something called flux in the production of tin. I can tell you all about the smelting and processing of tin, but I suspect that no one wants to hear about that. Moreover, what a man reads whilst he's on his potty should remain there. <laughs> The important thing to note is that palm oil was pretty useful and in high demand. Its supply was also less prone to fluctuations than, say, whale oil. And whale oil came from the colder regions of Europe, like Russia. And some severe winters in Russia, for instance, badly affected the supply of whale oil. And when the Crimean War was in full swing, that also um, affected the supply chains. 
So the supply of palm oil from West Africa was thought to be more predictable, less prone to fluctuations. It just so happened that there was a bunch of palm trees sitting in a very massive belt far off the coast of West Africa. These trees were just there like a natural resource. They were not actually cultivated. They were growing wildly and they flourished there perhaps because the indigenous peoples cleared large areas of forest and palm trees naturally grow better where there's less competition for sunlight from the taller rainforest trees. So there lay this dormant and useful resource far beyond the coasts that oil-hungry Europe did not know about or could not get to just yet or for some time they preferred not to because there was a far more profitable venture going on as people still preferred to trade in other people. To understand the rise of palm oil as a new go-to commodity, one must have an idea of what slavery did to trade in the region and how the efforts to suppress slavery gave birth to a new type of mono-commodity trade. So like I hinted earlier on, um, slavery had been going strong since the 16th century and both sides of the divide, that is the suppliers, from Africa and the purchasers from Europe had gotten quite good at it. They had set up efficient ways of procuring, storing and transporting enslaved people and it was very profitable. If you've listened to my History of Lagos series then you'd have seen that there were three essential criteria that were needed to be considered an important slave port. Firstly, you need a steady supply of slaves, um, usually from wars and raids. Um, you need contact with slave dealers or a network of middlemen and then geography, usually some kind of access to the coast. Now this list is not exhaustive and some of the criteria are self-fulfilling once the process starts. It becomes a vicious cycle. Um, for instance, I'm going to paint a rather simplistic scenario. For instance, you have some African king, as you did in Lagos with Adile, whose position isn't very secure and perhaps he has rivals to his throne. So he starts selling slaves and he makes a massive profit. He's had his first hit and he loves this feeling of being flush with cash. He has been able to buy out or ensure the loyalty of his chiefs and he raises an army. He needs to maintain the status quo. So he acquires more weapons with his new wealth. He starts a war with his neighbors. Ultimately, he gets more slaves and more money, more power and more status. The neighboring kingdoms will do the same thing or risk becoming victims themselves. This leads to a general volatility in the area and a near constant state of war. The Yoruba kingdoms, for instance, had a period of civil war for nearly a hundred years. The sad thing is, productivity of any other kind is often stifled and the whole economy teeters on the availability or price of slaves. The other sad thing is, the need or demand for European products, especially weapons, will outlast the trade in slaves. But while slave trade was still in its heydays, it had become quite organized. A whole complex self-sustaining system had been developed for capturing, transporting, holding slaves till when they could be sold off. A really well organized supply chain with middlemen, transporters, trade officials at the ports, collecting tolls and commissions and the rest. It was really well organized. So the most successful and powerful African states were also the most successful slaving kingdoms, unfortunately. Trading slaves simply meant access to wealth and European sourced weapons. Now, this is not to say that other types of trade did not exist. Of course, several of the items were being bought and sold, but slave trade contributed the most sizable chunk to the total exports. Now, palm oil along the oil rivers of the Niger Delta was one of such other trades that started to show some promise. Its growth had been rising in tandem with slavery. They used the same networks, but the similarities ended there. As slave trade began to decline, the importance of palm oil began to climb. So why and how did slave trade decline? Well, from the late 1700s, there had been a budding abolitionist movement in the vast British Empire. In Western Europe, the presence of slaves was very minimal, but their empires were built on the back of very profitable plantations which were in turn built on the back of slaves. The British Empire accounted for about nearly half of the total of transported slaves across the Atlantic. But towards the end of the 1700s, there was a gradual change in public opinion. Religion had a lot to do with it. People were coming to terms with the fact that it was just not morally right to enslave a fellow human being. Um, they were also worried about divine retribution. For instance, they thought that the loss of the American colonies 
during the American independence was due to God's vengeance on the United Kingdom because he was unhappy with them because of their involvement in slave trade. There were also some other less fine reasons. So the margin of profits were beginning to reduce. So it was still quite profitable to have unpaid labor, but they were starting to hit that point of diminishing returns. Also, there were very many slave revolts going on in the Caribbean, including the only recorded successful slave revolt, which was in Haiti from 1790. There was resistance from enslaved people, there was resistance from the clergy, there was resistance from um, some politicians as well. So all of this pressure eventually yielded fruit when Parliament passed the Slave Trade Act in 1807. This did not outlaw slavery, but aimed to suppress the international trade in enslaved people. It applied to British ships and any British ship found carrying slaves could be fined up to £100 for every slave found on board. It was only initially weakly enforced because the British were fighting the French and Napoleon at this, at this point in time. And essentially, prohibition was not the same as suppression because this was a venture, remember, 300 years old and extremely lucrative for the major Western powers who were not quite as keen as the British to put an end to the trade. By 1833, slavery was completely abolished in the UK, emancipating all the slaves within its vast empire. The government actually took loans to pay off slave owners, um, accruing a £20 million debt that would not be fully repaid until 2015. Britain had hoped that the rest of the major powers would soon join them, but no one else seemed too keen. And some of the superpowers like the United States of America were offended because they still had slaves on their land. And some like France uh, viewed Britain's, Britain's policing of the seas as suspicious. I'm sure it wasn't their main intention, but the Brits must have enjoyed it a little bit. Because I mean, if you upset the French, then that was just extra points for banter. Anyways, the British would keep on putting pressure on everyone until 1841, where there was a treaty for the suppression of African slave trade by, signed by Austria, France, UK, Prussia, and Russia. And this basically gave them the right to search each other's ships if they suspected they were carrying slaves and to treat such vessels as pirates. In truth, only the Royal British Navy could pull this off because as I said, Britannia ruled the seas and only them had enough ships to effect a blockade of such a vast area of the ocean. There was resistance to ending slave trade both from Africans and Europeans. Some African kings felt betrayed by the end of slave trade. Many did not think he solved the actual problem of slavery and saw it as Europe denying and confining the problems to African shores like out of sight and out of mind. Some were unhappy due to the loss of revenue. One of the kings of Dahomey, Gezo, said, The slave trade is the ruling principle of my people. It is the source of their glory and of their wealth. The mother lost the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery. I don't know about what kind of grim lullaby would that be? I don't think I knew what I was talking about. But anyway, this is just to show the kind of resistance that was put up by African monarchs. Um, there was also opposition in Europe as well. The British government bore 80% of the cost of military action to suppress slave trade. And their citizens always complained about the rising cost of sugar and other luxury tropical produce. I mean, sugar, slavery. Anyways, their share of world sugar production also fell by about... 30% and this was used to justify the need for slavery as a distasteful but nevertheless necessary evil. Anyways, from after 1807, a squadron of British ships began actively patrolling the coast of West Africa, including where Wari is located. Because, like I said, um, simply outlawing the trade in slaves didn't drive it away completely, it only just drove it underground. So it was essentially a game of cat and mice with the mice being the slave ships and then the cats being the patrolling naval vessels of the British Empire. The British Empire also had to adjust their tactics and many of the slave ships that they caught they would convert into naval ships themselves. Uh, one of such ships was a, a Baltimore ship called Dos Amigos, which was captured by a Royal Navy ship. Dos Amigos was renamed Fair Rosamond and in a tale of fate ended up partnering with the Black Joke, which was the name of the ship that caught her in the first place. Um, together, these two ships patrolled the west coast of Africa and had a field day patrolling and capturing slave ships, including a few in the oil rivers of the Niger Delta. On the 10th of September, 1831, the Fair Rosamund 
and the black joke were in the Bonnie River when two slave ships, the Regulus and Rapido, were seen exiting from the mouth of the river bound for Cuban slave ports. These two slave ships were much larger and outgunned the British ships who had a poorly trained crew. They initially headed for the two navy ships but eventually turned round and headed back into the river hoping to outrun and lose the British ships in the narrow waterways. But the British ship Black Joke was like, Holla, hell nah, I might joke to you. And together with her partner, the fair Rosamund, they gave chase. Whilst the slavers retreated up the river, they were seen throwing their slaves shackled together in twos overboard. And whilst a few were saved, it was estimated that probably about 150 or so may have been drowned by the slave traders in an attempt to cover up their crime. The two navy ships continued to give chase. One of the slave ships, the Regulus, ran aground, but still opened fire on the Fair Rosamond, who was further ahead of the two naval ships. She returned fire into the superstructure of the masts and sails to avoid hitting the slaves. The Regulus soon surrendered. The Fair Rosamond continued to press the Rapido and rammed into her. Her captain led the charge, cutlasses drawn, and boarded the Rapido, taking over the ship after a brief fight, even though being outnumbered significantly. The Fair Rosamund will continue to be active and was involved in another major action twice in five days when she detained two slave ships in the Benin River. This was seen by the Ishekiri villages that dotted the banks of the river. This was September 1837 and was one of the final nails in the coffin of the illegitimate trade. For resist as much as they wanted, it was becoming clearer every day that slave trade, or at least the international version of it, was nearing its end. The wiser Olus of worry and the powerful families saw that the handwriting was on the wall and began to diversify and clean up their slave money by investing in palm oil trade. It was beginning to look lucrative indeed. Demand was there in Europe and a logistic framework for moving produce to the buyers and ships was not entirely new to them. They'd after all been the middlemen for much of the slave trade. There were some differences to trading palm oil though. It had to be harvested and then processed. And the harvesting was usually done by men and the processing was done by women. It usually take three to five people about half a week to produce a tin of palm oil. Every aspect of it was very labor intensive and it was usually a family venture. So my lovelies, that was episode two, Fair Rosamond. Next episode comes out next week and we shall be introduced to the dawn of palm oil and the chaos of a troubled kingdom, as well as his subsequent and consequent rise of the two most powerful families in the Ishekiri kingdom. I hope you have an amazing week ahead and may your dreams take flight, move you closer to your heart's desires. Thank you all for listening and supporting. Thank you for your words of encouragement. Thank you to everyone who's reached out. Um, please follow, um, give a rating, um, engage with the question and answer session at the end of each podcast. These are just some of the ways that you can show some support, please. And thank you. Um, stay well, stay safe, and I shall speak to you soon. Bye.